one of my tasks was to give you a discussion of one of our research projects, and I thought this might be interesting uh, in light of a talk that I'm going to give later, uh, which is on high-risk prostate cancer. And it's uh, really a, a series of studies that I've done in collaboration with our partners at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, specifically Mary Ellen Taplin, uh, looking at neoadjuvant therapy for patients with uh, high-risk prostate cancer. So the, there's two premises I think we'll all agree with, uh, that local therapy only cures patients without metastatic disease. That's fairly broad. Uh, I'm actually somebody that believes that micrometastatic disease, if you remove the bulk of the tumor, some of it uh, can probably be eliminated. But I think it's a fairly safe premise that people that have metastatic disease need to have some sort of treatment of the systemic uh, 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 metastases. And uh, the timing, the second premise is that the timing of the systemic therapy uh, actually affects prognosis. What I mean by that is if you treat someone early when there's a small amount of metastatic disease, you're going to cure many more patients than if you wait until they have widely metastatic end-stage disease. So this is data from Scott Egner uh, looking at the likelihood of somebody dying of prostate cancer after radical prostatectomy. Uh, you, uh, across the top, you have different ages and different grades. And what you can see for various different, you know, younger to older, the black is the risk of dying of prostate cancer, the gray is the risk of dying of something else. And what you can basically see is that somebody who has high risk prostate cancer is at incredibly high risk for dying of the disease even if they undergo surgery. Uh, this just focuses in on it. If you're less than 60, uh, it's roughly at 25 percent, and you get up to 70, 79, even with surgery, uh, you have roughly a 40 percent risk of dying of disease if you have at least an 8 through 10 cancer. It's a, it translates to approximately 1 in 3 risk of dying of prostate cancer between 15 and 20 years after surgery. So uh, what is the best management, you know, radiation, surgery, uh, or multimodality? These are all arguments that focus on the local control of the cancer. And what I'm trying to argue in this is that death is from metastatic disease, and we as physicians who aren't just surgeons but are urologists who are responsible for treating the patients globally uh, need to prevent the patient from dying of metastatic disease, and systemic treatment is the way to go. So there have been multiple different randomized trials that have uh, introduced uh, systemic therapy into our armamentarium for patients that have metastatic castrate-resistant uh, prostate cancer. And again, I'm going to give a talk uh, on that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the AUA guidelines uh, in a day or two. But the bottom line is I just want you to draw your attention that even these, all of these are statistically significant, various different drugs. What you can see here is that the improvement in survival is only between two and five years, in, uh, months, excuse me, two and five months in length. And I'm not sure which is more shocking, the fact that that's such a small improvement in overall survival or that that represents a roughly, does that mean I have five minutes left? <laughs> I think it's shocking that that improves, that's a roughly a 30 percent improvement in those patients' uh, uh, survival. Uh, so adjuvant versus south. It should say adjuvant versus salvage systemic uh, therapy. That's a forget about the headline at the top. Earlier treatment in castrate sensitive uh, state has clearly been shown to improve that uh, uh, two to four month survival advantage to now one to two years. So there are at least four different studies using two different agents that have demonstrated this improvement in outcome. So this is no longer in the castrate resistant state, but now in the castrate sensitive state. So this is Latitude that was published about two years ago, roughly 1,000 men treated with either androgen deprivation therapy or androgen deprivation therapy plus abiraterone in patients that had newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer. And they, and they had to have pretty high-risk disease. Uh, you know, they had other factors to, in order to identify patients who not only had uh, metastatic disease, but what would be in quotes high risk metastatic disease. And it improved the uh, metastatic rate uh, from uh, 14 months or timing from 14 months to roughly 33 months, and it improved the overall survival from 34 months to not yet reached. So this is the uh, timing until uh, metastatic, uh, it, this is timing until uh, uh, death. And you can see the patients who received abiraterone and androgen deprivation therapy did dramatically better than those who received a placebo and androgen deprivation. And what I think is really important about this is the Kaplan-Meier curves are continuing to spread farther and farther apart. So as we get farther out, these patients are going to develop more benefit. So this is a variety of different disease states, breast, colorectal, lung. I probably could put up almost 
any cancer other than our own. And basically what you see is in the metastatic state, you see improvements uh, in response rate between 40 and 70 percent with systemic therapy. Uh, when you move it a little earlier in the disease, when the patient has metastatic disease but not heavily treated, uh, you see a survival advantage of somewhere around two years. And again, that's prostate cancer as well as the other, other diseases. But there's a survival in the neoadjuvant adjuvant state for all these diseases, uh, but we don't really know that in prostate cancer. And as I said, I can put up lung cancer. Uh, I already have lung cancer. I put up basically any disease. Bladder, uh, we all know that it works in bladder cancer. So this is the, uh, the idea, the, uh, the construct. Uh, with end-stage disease, we improve survival about two to four months. We move it earlier in the disease state to the meta newly diagno diagnosed metastatic state. We have an improvement of 12 to four, 24 months in survival. And if we move it into the uh, advanced, aggressive, localized disease, maybe we can actually cure more patients. Uh, now, those of you in the audience with uh, gray hair say, look, this has already been tried before and it doesn't work. Uh, so these are some of the randomized trials that were done in the 1990s uh, that basically showed there was an improvement in the positive margin rate, but no improvement in the, uh, in the uh, survival rate for patients that had uh, prostate cancer. I'd like to point out these were low-risk prostate cancer patients, and the, the duration of treatment was only approximately three months, and these were not the kind of aggressive advanced agents that we have at our disposal uh, in 2019. Uh, and there is data out there that would say that if we treat them more intensely for longer periods of time, we actually can improve the outcomes of these patients. So this is Lori Klotz's trial, published now almost 20 years ago, which basically, when he focused in on the patients that truly had aggressive disease, PSAs over 20 or a Gleason score 8 to 9, uh, eight, excuse me, 8, 9, and 10 cancer, you can see there is an improvement in, uh, in uh, survival, uh, both uh, for the high risk on the base of the PSA and also on the Gleason score. Uh, and uh, Martin Gleave did a study which unfortunately hasn't published, it's only been presented in abstract form, where he compared three months of androgen deprivation versus eight months of androgen deprivation and found that the margin positivity rate actually went down uh, if you treated them for a longer period of time. Uh, you know, no, fail no difference in PSA failure at three years, but it does uh, provide an argument that more intense therapy uh, does actually have an, an effect. So I'm going to describe four neoadjuvant trials that we've performed over the course of roughly 10 years. While Mary Ellen Taplin has really been the uh, leader of this, it could not have been done without collaboration at multiple other uh, different institutions. Uh, and this is basically the paradigm that I'm going to go over. Uh, intermediate and high-risk disease, so high volume Gleason 4 plus 3 or Gleason 8, 9, and 10 cancer, a T3 disease. The patients were treated, yeah, there was a correlative science piece. All the patients got intense androgen deprivation versus less intense androgen deprivation, and they got a radical prostatectomy. And the two things that we wanted to demonstrate in all of these studies is that we hit the target, that the tissue androgen levels actually went down more with the more intense therapy, and that there was an improvement in the response rate when you were actually looking at the tumor in the prostate, i.e., we were hitting the target. So this is the first one. Uh, this had, at this point in time, there were not very uh, uh, novel agents available. So it was essentially LHRH and biclinamide, LHRH and dutasteride, then the combination of all three, and then adding ketoconazole to it. And the patients only had three months of treatment prior to radical prostatectomy. And the important thing is the tissue androgen endpoint, I'm going to show you a little more detail, clearly hit its mark, and I'll give you a little more details on that. And we looked at pathologic complete response rate. Uh, it was roughly 8% in, uh, in the more uh, intense blockade arm compared to 0% in the less intense blockade arm. So this is what uh, tissue levels look like in controls in terms of dihydrotestosterone in this case. And this is the, uh, the sort of what I would term the standard androgen deprivation. And there's still a significant amount of dihydrotestosterone actually in the tumor after three months of treatment. Whereas if you look at the more intensely treated subjects, you can see that the dihydrotestosterone is practically down to zero. So this is the second trial, very similar inclusion criteria. And in this case, they were either treated with androgen deprivation therapy and abiraterone or androgen deprivation alone. Then they underwent a biopsy, and we're going to look at some of that correlative data. And then they underwent three months of, uh, three months of combined therapy, all of them, and then they underwent a prostatectomy. So roughly uh, one group had sort of a combination of just standard androgen deprivation plus the combination, and the others had six months 
Just to, I'm going to go through this. I think it's important to note that these are aggressive cancer patients, and they're going to get more aggressive as we go on. So all the patients had greater than Gleason 7. Roughly a third of them had Gleason 7 cancer, and roughly two-thirds of them had 8, 9, and 10. Uh, and if you look at the high-risk criteria, roughly 73, 75 percent of them uh, met the criteria, NCCN guidelines criteria, for aggressive prostate cancer. So again, we saw a decrease in the uh, intraprostatic androgens in the patients that were treated more intensely, so we hit our target. Uh, and the complete response rate now is down to around 14 percent in the maximum androgen deprivation arm. So again, this is the biopsy data, and you can see that in the patients that were treated with LHRH alone, you still continue to see an elevation in uh, dihydrotestosterone, but at three months and then again at six months, you see a remarkable decrease in the level of dihydrotestosterone, again proving that the drugs hit their target. So then this is the next study. Patients don't like getting androgen deprivation. So what we did is we looked at monotherapy with enzalutamide versus a more intense uh, androgen deprivation. The idea is maybe that the novel targeted therapy is going to do as good a job and you can save the patient uh, the aggressive intervention with an LHRH agonist. Again, just pointing out, we're getting more and more aggressive disease as we go along. So, uh, you know, roughly uh, 30 of these patients had Gleason 8, 9 or 10 cancer, and roughly another third had uh, Gleason 8, with again about a third having Gleason 7 and below. Uh, again, these are patients that have really bad prostate cancer. You're sensing a theme here. Uh, we hit the target, uh, the androgens dropped. Uh, and now we have a complete response rate or partial response rate of roughly 17 percent in the combined arm, and unfortunately we saw nothing in the enzalutamide arm alone. So monotherapy with an androgen deprivation like standard Lupron or, uh, or uh, any LHRH doesn't uh, do the trick. Enzalutamide on its own doesn't do the trick. You need a combination in order to, in order to uh, decrease the amount of cancer to essentially zero in the prostate. So these are the, these are the studies uh, looking at all of them uh, at the same time. Uh, a few themes here. You can see as you the complete response rate is always higher in the more intense arm. Uh, so roughly here you can see it's uh, roughly a 10 percent in the more intense arms. Now we've gotten it up around 10 percent in the uh, longer uh, duration, uh, and uh, only about 4 percent, unfortunately, in the uh, combination with enzalutamide. But if you combine the partial and the complete response rate, you can see that there's clearly an increase uh, in the patients that are having a very good local response. This is the last study. This has uh, just been accepted for publication. Very similar inclusion criteria. Patients are be treated with enzalutamide, uh, abiraterone, and LHRH versus uh, enzalutamide and, and uh, LHRH alone. Uh, so again, we're upping the intensity of our therapy, and it's still approximately six months in duration. Again, just to highlight, these are patients that have very aggressive cancer. We now have uh, almost all the patients, 88 percent of the patients, are in the high-risk category. Uh, and we're seeing very high percentage of patients, only 20 percent are Gleason 7, 80 percent are Gleason 8, 9, and 10. So these are the kind of patients who come into your office and you're worried about whether you're going to be able to cure them or not. So again, if we look at the complete and partial response rate, that I'll highlight that right here, it's roughly 30 percent in the combined arm compared to 16 percent in the, in the arm that still is fairly intense, but not quite as intense. And, and I think importantly, this uh, 16 percent is very similar to the 17 percent from the prior study, uh, which was a very similar uh, mode of treatment. Uh, so, uh, so I, I think that all these trials have shown that we have a very robust response to a very intense therapy, and I think that the idea of having this, this marker in the prostate as the canary in the coal mine to demonstrate that we're actually affecting micrometastatic disease in the patient is actually something that I think is very reasonable. Uh, and is increasingly being looked at at the FDA around a variety of different diseases, including breast, esophageal, colorectal cancer, uh, as well as what we're all familiar with, which was bladder cancer. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to bladder cancer, if you get a P0, that's a very good harbinger that the patient's going to do very well. What the FDA is bumping up against is as we move these treatments earlier and earlier and patients are living longer and longer, that window in order to demonstrate there's a survival advantage before the field continues to move forward is becoming just too long. And they're looking for alternative ways of, of, of looking at that. However, I think all of us would recognize that this is a surrogate endpoint. 
Uh, and so uh, what we did is tried to look and see if this surrogate endpoint actually correlated with something meaningful. That means whether they had a biochemical failure, whether they failed, whether they survived, whether they developed metastatic disease or not. So we pooled the analysis of the patients that were treated at our institution, University of Washington, and the BI Deaconess Medical Center, and we looked at the time to biochemical uh, failure and the time to develop metastatic disease. And one of the things we were really interested in is whether this minimal residual disease actually correlated with a meaningful outcome, and so we looked at that as well. So if you look at the patient population, they're fairly aggressive disease. Uh, roughly a third of them had Gleason 7, but again, uh, two-thirds of them had Gleason 8, 9, and 10. Uh, Seventy-five percent of them roughly had aggressive prostate cancer if used the NCCN guidelines, and roughly 25 uh, percent had uh, intermediate risk. So this is a time to biochemical recurrence. Again, the follow-up is relatively short. We've been doing these studies for about 10 years. I wish it was longer. Time will, will, will take care of that. You can see that we've cured uh, a, a relatively high percentage of the patients. 23 of the patients, uh, roughly a third, had a biochemical recurrence. Uh, and uh, three patients, excuse me, had three-year biochemical recurrence for your survival rate was 70 percent. Uh, and this was only looking at patients that had a normal testosterone, which was roughly about 90 percent of the patients. The time until metastasis, we actually had five patients who developed met metastatic disease in this relatively short interval, which I think proves that these are patients that had very aggressive disease. Uh, Three-year metastatic free survival was about 95 percent, which I think is pretty good, but again, there's no comparator. Uh, and uh, the uh, three-year overall survival rate was 98 percent. I think this is what uh, I think is the most interesting thing about this, this uh, study. So if you look at the patients that had T3 disease and they were downstaged uh, to uh, T2 or less, none of the patients recurred. None of them. Absolutely none. Whereas uh, this is pretty good, but it's not great. Uh, and then if patients had minimal residual disease, which was defined as 5 millimeters or less of cancer, or had no residual disease in the prostate, none of those patients recurred. Uh, whereas in the patients that had, you know, a slightly more cancer present, those patients had an appreciable recurrence rate. Uh, so uh, I think that's a fairly interesting result. I think it's hypothesis generating. I think it's consistent with my thinking uh, and others' thinking that if you are able to kill the cancer in the prostate, it's likely that the uh, residual or possible metastatic disease could actually respond. It's also uh, potentially uh, consistent with the hypothesis that the patients who had a response are those that don't develop metastatic disease, and they maybe uh, didn't have metastatic disease at the time of treatment. So I think I've, what I've tried to show you here is that longer androgen deprivation correlates with better pathologic response. More intense androgen deprivation correlates with better pathologic response. And a better pathologic response correlates with a lower recurrence rate. Uh, and all of this has led to a phase three registration trial in which I and Dr. Taplin are the uh, co-PIs, uh, in which patients are going to get fairly intense androgen deprivation with apalutamide and androgen deprivation therapy for six months prior to surgery. They're going to get the surgery, and then they're going to continue it for another six months afterwards. And this is the kind of trial that hopefully will allow us to prove that patients actually benefit from this kind of uh, intervention, and in my opinion, will uh, either move the needle or will prove that uh, we need to go back to the drawing board and think of a better way to, to manage these high-risk patients. I think the future is going to be something like this. Patients have a, aggressive prostate cancer. We remove it maybe uh, with surgery, possibly with radiation. Uh, patients are going to be cured. Uh, some patients are going to have occult a local disease. Some are going to have occult metastatic disease. And some are going to have both. And we'll have to use a second therapy on the local disease. Uh, my belief is surgery followed by radiation therapy is better. But, you know, as we continue to evolve, there may be other forms of local therapy that become increasingly used in terms of managing the local recurrence. Uh, occult systemic disease will be treated with systemic agents. And lastly, there will be a lot of patients that need both. And multimodality therapy will no longer be surgery plus radiation or radiation plus surgery. It will be surgery, radiation, and intense uh, systemic therapy. Uh, obviously, this is not work that I did on my own. Uh, it takes a cast of thousands to do this kind of work uh, at multiple different institute, institutions, and I highlighted in red Mary Ellen Taplin because she's really been the, the brains and the brawn behind getting all these studies possible. Thank you very much.